All right, well, this evening we're going to talk about election. And I realize in light of this morning's sermon, of course, the word election might have a certain connotation, but that's not the kind of election we're going to talk about here. Instead, we're going to talk about the election described in the Bible. The word election really just means choice. Uh, in politics, it refers to the candidate we're choosing uh, who will be elected to public office. But in the Bible, it means it's re more in reference to God choosing people for things. Does the Bible teach the concept of election? And uh, usually, closely related to that is something called predestination. Does the Bible choose, or does the Bible speak about these things? And the answer is yes, it does. And if we are Bible-believing Christians, we need to believe in things like election and predestination. Now, there are some religious groups that take those words and make them mean things that they do not mean in the Bible. And that is obviously wrong. We need to follow the biblical definitions. But at the same time, we should not be afraid to use the biblical terminology as it is put forth here. A lot of Christians have a problem with the idea that God chooses people, that God predestines things. Uh, there is an extreme idea, it's called Calvinism, that in, teaches that God predetermines all things, all events, good and bad. You don't really have any true say in whether you will be saved or lost because God made up His mind ahead of time whether you would have faith or not. And, you know, while they would not all express it that way, the logical end to their thinking is that you really have no free will. You, like everything else in this universe, are simply a cosmic marionette on one of an infinite number of strings that God controls and moves in His great sovereignty for His glory. That's the basic gist of Calvinistic thinking. Uh, granted, of course, you know the, one, the other gist of Calvinistic thinking is that they will always accuse you of misrepresenting their position and never be happy with the terminology you use to express it. But that's another issue for another day. The Bible does not teach extreme determinism. The Bible does not teach that we have no say, but it does teach concepts like election and predestination. And so instead of overreacting to a bad definition of terms, well, we should come back to the scriptures and see what God says on the matter. When I... Uh, this lesson kind of was requested, I guess, a little bit. You know, it was a conversation I had with someone a while back, and, you know, we need to have a lesson on this. I said, well, something to think about. So I got to thinking about it, and the first thing I did was I just looked up all the times that the Bible talks about God choosing someone. There's a lot of them. Who does God choose in the Scriptures? Well, one of the first people the Bible talks about God choosing is Abraham. In Genesis chapter 18, the Lord is trying to decide... Uh, whether or not he'll destroy Sodom and Gomorrah. And he has this conversation with Abraham. In verse 17, he says, Shall I hide from Abraham what I am about to do? Since Abraham will surely become a great and mighty nation, and in him all the nations of the earth will be blessed, for I have chosen him, so that he may command his children and his household after him to keep the way of the Lord by doing righteousness and justice, so that the Lord may bring upon Abraham what he has spoken about him. In Nehemiah chapter 9 and verse 7, the people sing a song, and one of the things they say is, You are the Lord God who chose Abram and brought him out of, from Ur of the Chaldeans and gave him the name Abraham. God chose Abraham for what was going on. Who else does God choose? God chooses Jacob. In... Malachi chapter 1, and this is quoted in the New Testament in Romans 9 as well. But in Malachi chapter 1, the scripture speaks of God's choice of Jacob over Esau. I have loved you. I'm starting in verse 2. I have loved you, says the Lord. But you say, how have you loved us? Was not Esau Jacob's brother, declares the Lord. Yet I loved Jacob, but I've hated Esau. And I have made his mountains a desolation and appointed his inheritance for the jackals of the wilderness. Romans 9 makes it even more pointed. In verses 10 through 12, it says, Not only this, but there was Rebekah also when she had conceived twins by one man, our father Isaac, 
though the twins were not yet born and had not done anything good or bad, so that God's purpose according to his choice would stand, not because of works, but because of him who calls, it was said to her, the older will serve the younger, just as it is written, Jacob I have loved, but Esau I have hated. When did God choose between Jacob and Esau? Well, according to Paul, he chose them before they were born. He chose which one was going to be the child of promise and which one was not. And he made that decision independently of anything they had done up to that point. It was, he said, Paul goes to great lengths to point out the fact neither one of them had been done anything good or bad yet. But God made a choice. And that choice, according to his purpose, would stand. When God makes a choice, well, mankind doesn't really get to dispute that choice. That's a principle that's in the scripture. Israel was chosen over and over again. Israel is one of the most common things that God has spoken about choosing. In Deuteronomy chapter 4 and verse 37, it says, Because he loved your fathers, therefore he chose their descendants after them. And he personally brought you from Egypt by his great power, driving out from before you nations greater and mightier than you, to bring you in and give you their land for an inheritance as it is today. God chose Israel. Why did God choose Israel? Did he choose Israel because they were a great and mighty people? No. Because Deuteronomy chapter 7 and verses 6 and 7 says that the Lord... Excuse me, verses 7 and 8, the PowerPoint's wrong. The Lord did not set his love on you, nor choose you, because you were more in number than any of the peoples, for you were the fewest of all peoples. But because the Lord loved you and kept the oath which he swore to your fathers, the Lord brought you out by a mighty hand and redeemed you from the house of slavery, from the hand of Pharaoh, king of Egypt. Chapter 9 takes it one step further and indicates that Israel's cho the choice of Israel had nothing to do with their personal righteousness. He says, Do not say in your heart, when the Lord your God has driven them out before you, because of my righteousness the Lord has brought me in to possess this land. But it is because of the wickedness of these nations that the Lord is dispossessing them before you. It is not for your righteousness or for the uprightness of your heart that you are going to possess their land, but it is because of the wickedness of these nations that the Lord your God is driving them out before you in order to confirm the oath which the Lord swore to your fathers, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. That's Deuteronomy 9, verses 4 and 5. And we could read more texts. I have a bunch more in the outline that aren't even on the PowerPoint. God chose Israel, and He did it even though they weren't that great of a people. Something to think about there. We'll get to the meaning of this in a minute. But the reason for God's choice of Israel is in large part related to His choice of Abraham, Isaac and Jacob. You notice that in this passage as well in verse 5. The Lord was doing these things with Israel in order to uh, in order to confirm an oath that he swore to them. What else is there? Well, the Bible also speaks about the Lord choosing Judah over Ephraim. Ephraim was uh, the son of Joseph who was considered preeminent even though he was not the firstborn. Joseph himself received the right of firstborn uh, among the, the tribes of Israel. It's a common misconception that Judah gets the, the right of the firstborn. That's not true. What happens in Genesis 48, Jacob tells Joseph, I give you one portion more than your brothers. And in 1 Chronicles 5, it says that Joseph was given the right of the firstborn, but Judah received the kingship. There's a difference between those two things. But in Psalm 78, the Bible talks about how Ephraim himself has been surpassed. Psalm 78, and verses 67 and 68, says that he also rejected the tent of Joseph and did not choose the tribe of Ephraim, but chose the tribe of Judah, Mount Zion, whom he loved. We could also talk about Moses. The Lord chose Moses. Psalm 106, and verse 23, says that, Therefore, he has said that he would destroy them, talking about Israel, had not Moses, his chosen one, stood in the breach before him to turn away his wrath from destroying them. That's kind of interesting. God almost destroyed one of the chosen people up here. You know, Israel. But he didn't do it because Moses, his chosen one, stood in the gap and interceded for the people and pleaded with God. Now, I, I realize in passing that we have not yet talked about what God is choosing all these people for yet. We're going to get to that. But I want to note something. It is a mistake to assume that just because God chooses somebody that they are saved. That is going to be cl become clear as we get into this. 
That's one instance there right there. The Lord was about to destroy Israel and start over. So clearly he's thinking about, you know, even though I've chosen Israel, I'm about to obliterate them. Had not Moses stood in the gap. We also think about Levi and Aaron. The Lord chose them for a very specific purpose to determine, because the Lord has the final say in who can draw near to him and who can approach him. In Numbers chapter 16, in verse 5, uh, Moses spoke to Korah and all his company, saying, Tomorrow morning the Lord will show who is his and who is holy, and will bring him near to himself. Even the one whom he will choose, he will bring near to himself. Do this. Take censers for yourselves, Korah and all your company, and put fire in them, and lay incense upon them in the presence of the Lord tomorrow, and the man whom the Lord chooses shall be the one who is holy. You have gone far enough, you sons of Levi. Well, who does the Lord choose? Who is allowed to approach the Lord? Does man get to, who gets to choose who approaches God? Does man get to choose that? Man doesn't get to choose that. God gets to choose that. That's why in Numbers 17, in verse 5, you know, he, he also talks about this test of Aaron's rod. Whoever, the rod of the man whom I choose will sprout. Thus I will lessen from upon Israel, well, myself, thus I will lessen from upon myself the grumblings of the sons of Israel who are grumbling against you. But what happened? You keep reading the story of Numbers 16. Korah and all his compatriots were, uh, were either swallowed alive when the ground opened up, or they were consumed by fire. The Lord clearly did not choose them. But number 17, Aaron's rod is the one that buds out of all the tribes of Israel, because Aaron was chosen out of all the people to draw near to the Lord, he and his descendants after him. God doesn't just choose people, he chooses places. That's another thing to think about. The book of Deuteronomy heavily emphasizes the fact that the people of Israel are to worship at the place which God chooses. Deuteronomy 12.5 You shall seek the Lord your God at the place which the Lord your God will choose from all your tribes to establish His name there for His dwelling. And there you shall come. Deuteronomy 12 and verse 11, It shall come about that the place in which the Lord your God will choose for His name to dwell, there you shall bring all that I command you, your burnt offerings, your sacrifices, your tithes, the contribution of your hand, and all your choice votive offerings which you will vow to the Lord. In verses 13 and 14, Be careful that you do not offer your burnt offerings in every cultic place you see, but in the place which the Lord chooses in one of your tribes, there you shall offer your burnt offerings, and there you shall do all that I command you. This came up in Bible class this morning. Was it okay to offer sacrifices to the Lord in a place that He did not choose, like the high places? No, that was not appropriate. The Lord did not approve of the high places. The Lord says, you worship me at the place that I choose. When God makes a choice, that excludes other choices. And in the Bible, in fact, this is in 1 Kings... The Lord chooses the city of Jerusalem as the place where He is to be worshipped. As the place where His name is to dwell. This is a huge emphasis of the book of 1 and 2 Kings. In 1 Kings 8.44, for instance, Solomon makes reference to this uh, in his prayer. When, you're, when your people go out to battle against your enemy by whatever way you send them, and they pray to the Lord toward the city which you have chosen and the house which I have built for your name, then hear in heaven their prayer and their supplication and maintain their cause. In 1 Kings chapter 11, the prophecy of Ahijah, well first, the Lord speaks to Solomon and tells him, you've been worshipping idols, you've taken these foreign women for your, your wives, you're not supposed to do that, I am tearing away the kingdom from your son. But... Verse 13, I will not tear away all the kingdom, but I will give one tribe to your son for the sake of my servant David and for the sake of Jerusalem, which I have chosen. Again in verse 32, that comes up. Uh, that Solomon will have one tribe for the sake of my servant David and for the sake of Jerusalem, the city which I have chosen from all the tribes of Israel. And uh, we could look at some more scriptures about that. There's a lot, a lot of... Again, this is just the tip of the iceberg. There's a ton of passages that talk about the Lord choosing the city of Jerusalem for His name to dwell. The Lord is supposed to choose the king. Deuteronomy 17.15 says that. At first, God chose Saul as king. But the people are also said to have chosen Saul as king. In 1 Samuel 12 and verse 13, for instance. However, 
the Lord chose David, ultimately, the man after his own heart, to be king. In 1 Samuel chapter 16, uh, Samuel goes to the house of Jesse in Bethlehem. In 1 Samuel 16, in verses 8 through 10, Jesse called Abinadab and made him pass before Samuel, and he said, The Lord has not chosen this one either. And uh, Jesse made Shema pass by, and he said, The Lord has not chosen this one either. And they, they keep passing by, and the Lord's saying, You know, I don't choose this one, I don't choose this one. But what happens? He chooses David. In verse 10, Jesse made seven of his sons pass before Samuel. Samuel said to Jesse, The Lord has not chosen these. But the Lord chooses David. In 2 Samuel 6 and verse 21, this is explicitly stated by David himself. Now he danced before the Lord who chose me above your father and above all his house to appoint me ruler over the people of the Lord, over Israel. Therefore I will celebrate before the Lord. I want to note something else. I've been pointing out a couple times where someone is chosen over someone else. Like Jacob chosen over Esau. Or... Uh, Levi, chosen over the other tribes of Israel. Or Judah, chosen over Ephraim. Or David, chosen over his brothers, but he was also chosen over Saul, according to uh, 2 Samuel 6.21. So, you know, this choice of David as king, and again, there's more passages than I've got listed up here. Uh, but what, what we see here is that God has chosen David as his king. He's chosen Levi as his priesthood, and not just them, but their families as well. And we can go on. We can look at how the Lord chooses Solomon. We can look at how the Lord chooses Zerubbabel in Haggai chapter 2 and verse 23. Uh, I don't want to... I mean, you know, we can could, we could get into this in more detail. But let's fast forward a little bit. Oh, and one more thing before we move on. Sorry. We can't fast forward yet because this one's important. The servant of the Lord is someone whom God chooses. The book of Isaiah talks a lot about a figure named the servant of the Lord. Isaiah 41 and verse 9 talks about you who I have taken from the ends of the earth and called from its remotest parts and said to you, you are my servant, I have chosen you and not rejected you. Again, Isaiah 42, behold my servant whom I uphold, my chosen one in whom my soul delights. I have put my spirit upon him. He will bring forth justice to the nations. And on and on we could go. There's a lot of passages that talk about the servant of the Lord as God's chosen one. Now, there have been many people who are servants of the Lord throughout history. In fact, you could say that all of these people who were chosen by God were chosen for, to be His servants, to perform a service. Who is, the, who is the ultimate chosen one? The ultimate servant of the Lord? You've been in Bible class, you know the answer is Jesus. Who God chooses is Jesus. And this is mentioned many times in the New Testament. How Jesus is described as the chosen one. On the Mount of Transfiguration in Luke chapter 9 and verse 35, the voice from heaven says, This is my Son, my chosen one, in whom I am well pleased. Listen to Him. In Luke chapter 23 and verse 35, that's the mockery that they're making of him while he's on the cross, by the way. He saved others, let him save himself, if this is the Christ of God, his chosen one. They believed the Christ was the chosen one. The Bible continues to affirm that in 1 Peter chapter 2, in verse 4, for instance. Coming to him as to a living stone, which has been rejected by men, but is choice and precious in the sight of God. It's the same word there, I don't know, you know, choice, chosen, you know, the same term in Greek. You also, as living stones, are being built up as a spiritual house for a holy priesthood to offer up spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God through Jesus Christ. For this is contained in Scripture. Behold, I lay in Zion a choice stone, a precious cornerstone. He who believes in Him will not be disappointed. You think, well, how can Jesus be the chosen one? Well, He is. Well, he is. He's God in the flesh, yes, but He's also God's chosen Jesus himself chooses the disciples. He spends all night in prayer to God in Luke 6, 12. And then he, the next day, chooses 12 disciples to follow him. In verse 13. He talks about in John 15, 16, how I chose you. Then we get back to the same question. When God chooses you, does that mean you're saved? Well, what about Judas? He chose Judas. Think about that. This comes up in John chapter 6 and verse 70, doesn't it? He says to the disciples, Did I not myself choose you, the twelve? 
Yet one of you is a devil. He met Judas, the son of Iscariot, for he was one of the twelve who was going to betray him. Again, in John chapter 13, in verse 18, he says, I do not speak of all of you. I know the ones I have chosen, but it is that the Scripture may be fulfilled. He who eats my bread has lifted up his heel against me. We could also think of Paul. In Acts chapter 9, and verse 15, Paul is described as God's chosen vessel to carry the gospel to the Gentiles, to be a light for them. Or we can think about Peter in Acts 15 and verse 7. Peter describes himself as the one. He said, you know, remember at the beginning, God made a choice that through me the Gentiles would hear the gospel. Or, well, what else is there? Who else is chosen in the Bible? What about us? Christians. The elect. You know that the term elect is used to describe the people of God quite a bit in the scriptures. It's a very dominated term. It rivals words like saints and disciples. It appears far more in... In fact, Christians are called elect far more than they're called Christians in the scripture. That's kind of interesting in and of itself. We are the chosen people of God. And it's appropriate to say that, biblically speaking. But let's look at some of these passages. In Romans chapter 8, in verse 33. Well, if, excuse me, I'll start in verse 31. What shall we say to these things? If God is for us, who is against us? He who did not spare his own son, but delivered him over for us all, how will he not also with him freely give us all things? Who will bring a charge against God's elect? God is the one who justifies. Who is the one who condemns? Christ Jesus is he who died. Yes, rather who was raised, who is at the right hand of God, who also intercedes for us. In 1 Peter chapter 1, in verse 1, the Apostle Peter writes, To those who reside as aliens scattered throughout Pontus, Galatia, Cappadocia, Asia, and Bithynia, who are chosen according to the foreknowledge of God the Father, by the sanctifying work of the Spirit, to obey Jesus Christ and be sprinkled with His blood. May grace and peace be yours in the fullest measure. Of Colossians chapter 3 and verse 12. It says, So as those who have been chosen of God, holy and beloved, put on a heart of compassion, kindness, humility, gentleness, and patience, bearing with one another, and forgiving each other, whoever has a complaint against anyone, just as the Lord forgave you, so also should you. And on and on and on we could go. What do we do with this? And part of that, of course, is the description of how God chose the poor and the foolish. 1 Corinthians chapter 1 and verses 27 and 28. You know, there were not many mighty, not many noble, but God has chosen the foolish things of the world to shame the wise. God has chosen the weak things of the world to shame the things that are strong, the base things of the world and the despised. God has chosen the things that are not so that He may nullify the things that are. In James chapter 2 and verse 5, It talks about how, listen, my beloved brethren, did not God choose the poor of this world to be rich in faith and heirs of the kingdom, which He promised to those who loved Him? Local churches are sometimes described as chosen. Your chosen sister in Babylon greets you. 1 Peter 5.13 2 John talks about... John writes to someone called the elect lady or the chosen lady. Uh, there's a lot of debate about who that is. But the most likely suggestion, and you know that's... This is, and you're free to dispute this one, is that he's writing to a local church. And that's who the elect lady is in that context. Um, and he goes on in verse 13, you talk about how the children of your chosen sister also greet you. And, okay, one more, one more thing. We need to read a key text about this. And we're not going to spend a lot of time on this text because of the length and because uh, we covered it in a sermon a while back. Ephesians chapter 1, verses 3 through 14, is an important text about God choosing us, about predestining us, and about all the things that He does for us. The great blessings that He bestows on us. It says, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places in Christ, just as He chose us in Him before the foundation of the world that we would be holy and blameless before Him. In love, He predestined us to adoption as sons through Jesus Christ to Himself, according to the kind intention of His will, 
to the praise of the glory of His grace, which He freely bestowed on us in the Beloved. In Him we have redemption through His blood, the forgiveness of our trespasses, according to the riches of His grace, which He lavished on us. In all wisdom and insight, He made known to us the mystery of His will, according to His kind intention, which He purposed in Him, with a view to an administration suitable to the fullness of the times, that is, the summing up of all things in Christ, things in the heaven, and things on the earth. In Him also we have obtained an inheritance, having been predestined according to His purpose, who works all things after the counsel of His will, to the end that we who are the first to hope in God would be to the praise of His glory. In Him you also, after listening to the message of truth, the gospel of your salvation, having also believed, you were sealed in Him with the Holy Spirit of promise, and was given as a pledge of our inheritance with a view to the redemption of God's own possession, to the praise of His glory." What has God done to bless us? This text talks about six things. He chose us. He predestined us to adoption. He gave us redemption and forgiveness. He made His secret will known to us. He predestined us to an inheritance. And He sealed us with the Spirit. It's an incredible wealth of blessings that the Lord has bestowed on us. But it all starts with His choice. With Him choosing. Now what does that mean? Now, this is the part where I think we struggle a little bit. How can God, if, it's real, if there's really a such thing as free will, and there is, how can God know in advance these things? Uh, some people think maybe God chooses not to know things, even though no scripture in the Bible ever says such a thing or suggests such a thing. But, I think there's, a, there, there's, a, there's an important lesson in the book of Ephesians itself. The book of Ephesians frequently talks about this idea of seeing the end result before we get there. You move a little bit ahead. In Ephesians chapter 2 and verse 6, it talks about how God loved us, bestowed mercy on us, and in verse 6, raised us up with Him and seated us with Him in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus. Question, are we presently seated in the heavenly places? Well, not literally so, since we're currently still on earth and we're currently still in the world. Why does Paul then speak of this as if it were a present reality? Because that's the perspective of Christianity. When you boil it all down, we see the end result before it happens. We are in Christ now and it is as if we already know, what the, we already know how the world's going to end. We already know what's going to happen. We already know where, where we're going. And we know that the end result is so certain and so sure it is as if it has already happened. We see it. And if we can see it, how much more God, when you really think about it, how much more does God see the end result before we get there? Now, this is, it is, in this context, it's not hard to see how we can speak of God predestining people. Because if we can see the end result from now, God can see it from the beginning. He has a much greater understanding of it than we can. I realize we've just gone through a lot of data very fast, and some of it may... I hope that this has been encouraging up to this point. Um, perhaps we're a little dry at the moment. Let's ask some questions. We talk about God choosing people. This is a question people bring up sometimes. Does God choose people for salvation, or does He choose people simply to perform a task or service? Well, sometimes, and we've noted a lot of these times, sometimes the choice that God makes is actually for a service or a function. Uh, that, was the tru that was true of a lot of different people. But, you know, the example of ethnic Israel is pretty telling. Why did God choose Israel? What was the main purpose that God had for Israel? Their main service that God had them perform was the service of bringing Christ into the world. There are two passages in Romans that allude to this idea. In Romans 3, in verses 1 and 2, Paul asks, What advantage has the Jew? What is the benefit of circumcision? Great in every respect. First of all, that they were entrusted with the oracles of God. What does that mean, Paul? Well, he doesn't come back to that until chapter 9, in verses 1 through 5, where he starts mentioning his own, uh, his own heartfelt emotions for his brethren. He says, I'm telling the truth in Christ. I'm not lying. My conscience testifies with me in the Holy Spirit that I have great sorrow and unceasing grief in my heart. 
For I could wish that I myself were accursed, separated from Christ, for the sake of my brethren, my kinsmen according to the flesh, who are Israelites to whom belong the adoption of sons, and the glory, and the covenants, and the giving of the law, and the temple services, and the promise. Whose are the fathers, and from whom is the Christ? According to the flesh, who is over all. God blessed forever. Amen. main service Israel performs is bringing Christ into the world. And there's many other services that you see in Scripture, but God chooses people for service. But, sometimes the choice is for salvation. We already looked at Ephesians 1.4, how He chose us in Him before the foundation of the world and predestined us to adoption as sons. 2 Thessalonians chapter 2 says something rather pointed. It said, we should always give thanks to God for you, brethren, beloved by the Lord, because God has chosen you from the beginning for salvation through sanctification by the Spirit and faith in the truth. Now that's pretty pointed. Does God choose who's going to be saved? Well, yeah. I mean, we already looked at passages where God alone is allowed to decide who approaches Him. And the only people who are going to be saved ultimately are the ones who can approach Him. So who is saved? You know, well, the, the big answer to that, whoever God says is saved. Now, if God says that the person who trusts in me and is immersed in water for the forgiveness of their sins is going to be saved, then that person's going to be saved because God determined it that way. That's who God chose. What if God decided to make an exception to His rule? What if God just arbitrarily said, uh, you know, He wasn't baptized, but... You know, I like the way he's lived, so I'm going to save him too. Can God do that? Well, he's God. Now, let's flip the situation around. Man says, well, I know what God has said, but, you know, I, I want to choose my own way to be saved. Does it work that way? No, it doesn't work that way. Because man doesn't get to decide how to be saved. Man doesn't get to choose that. God chooses that. That's how it works. If the Lord decides that those who are baptized will be saved, but then turns around and saves somebody who wasn't baptized, or who don't, we have no reason to believe the thief on the cross was baptized, but we have no business in saying that. That's the Lord's choice. He's allowed to make that choice. We don't get to make that choice for Him. We don't get to make that choice for ourselves. That's, I think, a real lesson of the thief on the cross is God can do whatever He wants. Because that's who He is. He's God. He has mercy on whom He desires. God has the right to be arbitrary because He is God. And God also has the right to set conditions and call His choice based on that. Let's ask another question. There's a question about whether God's choice is group or individual. Well, if you've been paying attention to this lesson, you already know the answer is yes. Both are sometimes chosen by God. Sometimes God chooses individuals like Abraham or Isaac or Jacob. And sometimes God chooses groups like the descendants of the patriarchs or the descendants of Levi and David, I already noted that, or even a city like Jerusalem. Okay, so what do we do with that? You know, it's also true in the New Testament as well. God chooses individuals like Jesus, Paul, the disciples, but God also chooses groups, local churches, the universal church, i.e. the group of all the saved, the elect. God chooses individuals. And he chooses their descendants as well. He chooses us. You know, if God chose David's descendants, doesn't he also choose Jesus' spiritual descendants as well? Well, yeah, he does. Those who walk in the footsteps of Jesus, who are his descendants, well, they're chosen by God as well. In Ephesians chapter 1, the context of that passage, which is uh, so tantalizing to people, it, it suggests an emphasis on... I don't like the word corporate because it makes you know, it envisions this giant business. But you know, it's this idea of the corporateness of election. Uh, it's the corporateness of God's choice. God didn't sit down and say, "All right, let's see. I like Tom, Bill, and Bob, but I don't like Dan Smith and Jones. So Tom, Bill, and Bob get to go to heaven, and Dan Smith and Jones get to go to hell." Is that the way it works? Is that what God did before the foundation of the world? Did God sit up in heaven and you know pick names out of a hat and say, "You're going to be saved and you're going to be lost"? Is that what God's doing? Does the Bible portray it that way? Not really. 
God's always determined to have His group, to have His Israel, if you will, a collective of people who love Him and who strive to do His will. That's a plan that's always existed. Paul teaches that idea to the early Christians. They are participants in the great cosmic community, the great spiritual Israel that has been planned since the beginning and is even under construction right now for its final realization. Why do so many of the metaphors for the church describe something that's in process? Think about it. A body that's growing to maturity? A bride that's betrothed to a husband? A building that is under construction? These things indicate that it already exists, but it is not yet complete. The point isn't that God is randomly picking winners and losers out of a hat. The point is that He determined ahead of time to save people that were part of this spiritual Israel, that were part of this heavenly Jerusalem, and that had a stake in that city. That had their names written in the heavenly roster of that city we call the Book of Life. How long has that plan been in place? longer than we have. It's been in place since the foundation of the world. In fact, that's the meaning of predestination. Let's talk about predestination for a minute. What is that? Predestination means to determine something ahead of time. That's basic cookie-cutter definition. It is assumed in Scripture. The Bible never actually explains the mechanisms of it. It doesn't tell us the nuts and bolts of predestination. Which means, of course, that people have written far more about that than they've written about anything else. Because that's human tendency is to try to fill in the blanks that God leaves for him. You know what? Well, it, when we talk about predestination, there's really only two things in the Bible that God explicitly is said to have predestined. Now, one of them we've already read, and that's our adoption as sons. But the other one is Jesus dying on the cross. Acts chapter 4, in verse 28. You know, there's the great debate, who killed Jesus? I've met people who try to sort of make it like God had nothing to do with the death of Jesus because we can't have God killing the Son. But that's precisely what the Scripture says. That in this city there were gathered together against your holy servant Jesus, whom you anointed, both Herod and Pontius Pilate, along with the Gentiles and the peoples of Israel, to do whatever your hand and your purpose predestined to occur. Acts chapter 2 says a similar thing, that this man, Jesus, delivered over by the predetermined plan and foreknowledge of God, you nailed to a cross by the hands of godless men and put him to death. The death of Jesus wasn't an accident. It was the whole plan. It wasn't a contingency. It was what God had planned from the beginning. That is the thing that mankind has struggled to get his mind around. That is the offense of the cross right there. 1 Corinthians 2 and verse 7. We speak God's wisdom in a mystery, the hidden wisdom which God predestined before the ages to our glory, the wisdom which none of the rulers of this age has understood. For if they had understood it, they would not have crucified the Lord of glory. That's how God is. He's the master planner. He plans it out ahead of time, and you can't stop Him. And you can't undermine Him. And you're not even going to know the end of the story until He tells it to you. Because that's how His predestination works. Here's some other observations. First of all, the election of some assumes the rejection of others. And we've already noted this with Jacob and Esau and with others. Romans 9 goes into detail about Pharaoh. Pharaoh who uh, the Lord hardened Pharaoh's heart. Sometimes the Bible says that Pharaoh hardened his own heart. Sometimes the Bible says the Lord hardened Pharaoh's heart. Which is true. Well, both are true. And I'm content to leave it at that. Now, well, because this, and there's always implication of responsibility in there as well. People are chosen to do something. They don't do their task. God will make them do it anyway, but they're not going to enjoy it. Like Pharaoh. Did Pharaoh do what God wanted him to? Well, yeah. He let the people go. Pharaoh could have chosen to let the people go at any time. But every time he said no, the Lord continued to use him for his purpose and his glory. He told Pharaoh, I could have killed you. But I'm letting you remain. Because I want people to see what I do to you. I want you to see what I'm going to do to you in part of this nation. Not everyone who was chosen is saved. We already noted that. Israel, Israel is elected but redefined 
in, in light of the time, I'm going to skip the discussion on Romans 11, although I think Romans 11 is a super, super, super important passage for understanding this. So I highly recommend you read it at some point. You know, Israel, you know, there's some people that teach that, you know, ethnic Israel still has a separate future from the church as we know it. Uh, you know, that doesn't really, that isn't really sustained in the full argument of Romans 9 through 11, but uh, it's kind of worthy of its own lesson. The election happened before the world did. Of course, we have a number of passages. God made this plan before the beginning. What about free will? Sometimes you'll hear people say, oh, the Bible doesn't talk about free will. Yeah, it actually does. You know, that's the thing. You know, people just ignore all the passages that talk about free will. And once again, there's actually two people choosing things in the Bible. I've emphasized a lot about the stuff God chooses. And I've emphasized a lot about stuff man doesn't get to choose. Man gets to choose one thing, though. And what's the thing that man gets to choose? Whom will you serve? We already sang about it. For me and my house, we will serve the Lord. That statement came in the context of a discussion Joshua was having. Make a choice. Choose for this day whom you will serve. There's God's choice. There's our choice. Deuteronomy 30. I've set before you life and death, the blessing and the curse. So what? So choose life that you may live. Joshua 24, verse 15. Choose for yourselves this day whom you will serve. We have a choice to make. Now sometimes people choose the wrong things. Sometimes people choose God instru God's instruction, which is the right thing. Sometimes people choose... Ill, well, and sometimes people choose ill treatment. Hebrews 11.25 Moses chose ill treatment with the people of God rather than the passing pleasures of sin. Sometimes people don't choose God. Sometimes they choose idols instead. And just like predestination, the Bible assumes free will. It never explains it. It only assumes it. Look at Isaiah chapter 7 verses 15 and 16. Free will is a real thing. Because Isaiah is told that he's going to have a son, and regardless of whether you think Emmanuel was a literal child that Isaiah had, or he's only fulfilled in Jesus, uh, in verse 14 it says, The Lord himself will give you a sign. A virgin will be with child and bear a son. She will call his name Emmanuel. He will eat curds and honey at the time he knows enough to refuse evil and choose good. For before the boy will know enough to refuse evil and choose good, the land whose two kings you dread will be forsaken. Now that passage doesn't argue for free will. That passage just assumes it. It just assumes that's a real thing, guys. It also assumes there's a such thing as an age of accountability, interestingly enough. Other things people sometimes pretend isn't in the Bible. There is a point in time where people can choose good and evil, and there's a point in time where people can't choose good and evil. And that basic principle is really all there is to it. You know, does God choose people? Absolutely. But guess what? We have to choose God, too. So the question we have to ask ourselves is, will we choose Him back? God chose us. Will we choose Him? Think about it. Isn't that true in any human relationship, though? What is adoption, for instance? Adoption is when you take a child that isn't yours and you make them your child, and you become their provider, and their nurturer, and their instructor, and their caregiver. What kind of love does it take to give up your own perfectly good son, who loves you, who does everything you tell him to, who has never given you any hassle, I'm going to give you up and trade you for a bunch of misfits. Because that's what happened. The Lord gave up His Son to adopt us, the dysfunctional children. Why in the world would God do something like that? Because of the good pleasure of His will, that's why. God, the Bible talks about salvation as God's will. It's not just that God was sort of willing to do it. It's that He wants to do it. He's glad about it. But here's the thing about it. It's also akin to a marriage. Let me ask you something. You know, if somebody chooses who they're going to marry, does that mean they're going to get married? Sometimes she doesn't choose him back. That's a problem. You know, sometimes a man chooses a woman and says, I like this woman. I'm going to marry this woman. And that woman doesn't choose him back. Hmm. You know, can he unilaterally force himself on her? Well, he wouldn't be very loving, loving if he did that, would he? 
But, you know, there, there's a reason that our relationship with God, there's a reason that the relationship between Christ and the church is analogous to that of a husband and a wife. Because there has to be reciprocity. There has to be a mutual exchange there. God chose us, but He also decided to give us a choice in the matter. You can choose to accept His love and to say, yes, I want to be wed to you. Or you can choose to reject it. So let's ask another question. Why in the world would you? Why in the world would you reject it? Something to think about. That's the lesson. I hope I said something tonight that was encouraging or edifying. I realized that this is one of those lessons that didn't, uh, didn't give a lot of like, practical, you know, here's tips for daily living. But I, I hope that it's at least given us a big picture about the relationship between God and His people and how He acts. And I hope it maybe has cleared up some questions or confusion for you. Maybe. Um, of course, it could have just have eagerly muddied the water, I suppose. But we'll see how that works. Anyhow, I hope if, if we leave us with any message, it's this. Choose life that you may live. Choose to do good and not do evil. Forsake wickedness and pursue righteousness. Now, if your relationship with the Lord is not what it should be, if you have not chosen the Lord, you've not been baptized into Christ, perhaps you have, and you realize that your life hasn't been a series of good choices for the Lord since that time, and you need to make a turnaround, God has chosen you. Will you choose Him? Think about it. All together we stand and we sing.